everyone. Good morning, everybody, on this Friday. Uh, welcome to the Nikki Maduro Show. Without Nikki Maduro today, because she is headed to Las Vegas to ride bicycles. So that is where she will be for the next few days. But it's a big Friday on the Nikki Maduro Show. John Rothman is waiting in the wings. We've also got Tim Sika coming on today. And what a morning it's been. I saw you guys talking in the chat about this earthquake on the East Coast, a magnitude 4.8. And I was thinking I would almost rather us have these earthquakes because I don't know if their buildings are up to the same type of code that ours are. Uh, reading this morning on CNN that apparently the earthquake is felt in a wider range there because of the type of rock on the East Coast. And so I guess it reverberates more. So a lot more people felt it. People streaming out into the streets in New York. Uh, they don't I don't think they know how to react like we do on the on the West Coast. We're like a 4.8. Yeah, that's some serious business. You felt that shaking. We understand what that's about. They um they had to slow the trains, of course, to check the tracks. The governor of New York had a, a briefing. It doesn't look like they had any serious repercussions, like no injuries, serious injuries, you know, nothing hugely damaged. But I'm sure that was an interesting morning for them. Not They're not used. That's kind of rare to have an earthquake on the East Coast like that. Apparently, it was felt from Philadelphia to New York. Hmm. Um, it is impacting air travel flights airport and airports to New York City, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Newark were being held until they made sure everything was okay. But yeah, no life threatening situation. So welcome to California, New York, right? All right. Um, before we really get into it, I do want to ask you to click the like button if you can. Also, subscribe, because we're still trying to grow this show, even though it will be changing uh, coming up. And we'll talk about that when Nikki gets back. We're still kind of formulating plans for that. I think the truth is we need to get real jobs, both of us. You know, we're, we tried to make it sustainable, but it just isn't. And it doesn't mean the show is going away. It just means we're changing the way we do things. So, um Auntie Tobby wanted to talk to you about that before we bring in John Rothman, because it is, let's see if I can get the pictures up. Yes, the hot sauce, the hibiscus hot sauce. If you like that heat in your mouth, Auntie Tobby is bringing it for you with the hibiscus hot sauce, also the pineapple hot sauce. And here's the one I've got coming to me. It's the barbecue sauce without a lot of heat. Uh, the guava flavored barbecue sauce. So our thanks to Auntie Tobby's for sponsoring the Nikki Maduro show and hope that you enjoy all of the offerings as much as we enjoy telling you about them. All right. A lot of politics to talk about this morning. And also um, a story about decaf coffee. So if you're drinking decaf, I have some information for you. But first, without further ado, I would like to bring in our friend John Rothman. Hey. Good morning. Good morning to you. How's it going? Wonderful. And how are you without your darling daughter with you on a regular basis now that she's on a field trip? So she's back. She's back. She did go to New York. She missed the earthquake, apparently. Maybe she's the one that brought it and left it. I don't know. Um, but she's back. And she said out of 10, that trip to New York was a 9.5. So that's pretty high on the scale. <laughs> Yeah, I'm they impressed. A, they had a great time. She's home today, though. Both kids are home today because it's been a heck of a week in Petaluma. So yes. I don't know if you've been following the Petaluma news, school related news. But first, at Julius High School, Petaluma High, on I think it was Tuesday, they had this woman having a mental health crisis who was naked and covered in blood and walked into the gym and was writing on the floor in her own blood. It was a mess. So she got help taken away and the kids are offered counseling at the school then the next day across town at the kenilworth junior high school a kid or two uh, brings an m1000 into the bathroom and sets off this giant firecracker in the bathroom two kids arrested then the next day we have a call in of threats so last night i get a, a email from the school district saying there's a threat of 
um, someone shooting up the two junior high schools and the two high schools in town, public high schools. Um, and so they think it's a hoax and they think it's some type of copycat thing. But just to be sure, we kept her, we kept the kids home. So, yeah. My goodness, there's such excitement in Petaluma. It's true. I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of these things where I guess it's the day and age we live in where sometimes there's a threat. Someone's going to shoot up the high school and you have to figure out the chances of it are really low. But do you take that risk? I don't take the risk. No, you can't. No, you can't. Uh, and it's a shame. Uh, so, but this is the world in which we live and with social media being able yep. to uh, convey messages so quickly, I'm sure this is going to escalate. It, it's the same thing with artificial intelligence. We're seeing the impact of that, and that has to do with schools as well. So there's so many different factors. And, uh, well, but I'm looking forward, by the way, to whatever news the Nikki Maduro show <laughs> has. And uh, uh, this is going to be very exciting. All right. Well, let's first talk about RFK Jr. Because I was reading last night, RFK, about this fundraising message that he sent out. Now, they're walking this back big time, trying to distance themselves from this. But he sends out this fundraising message. And he talks about Julian Assange, um, who is the founder of WikiLeaks, right? And he calls him a political prisoner. And then he makes this connection between Julian Assange and the January 6th criminals prosecuted in American courts of law for being violent, trespassing in the capital of the United States, hurting people, right? And he, he basically says that they were stripped of their constitutional liberties. It's the Oprah drop. What? No, they weren't. So in my mind, John Rothman, you have a right to protest. You can't gather outside the Capitol and wave your Trump flag all day long till the sun goes down and beyond. You can say this is a, you know, this election I don't agree with. You can say some pretty horrible things. You can say some things that aren't even true, perhaps. But you can't break in. You can't hurt people. Right? You can't break the law. I don't understand how that could be even a mistake or some something that someone could think. No, it's, but it's Bobby Kennedy Jr. It's why he's not a creditable candidate. And you may have heard U.S. District Judge Royce Lambert, uh, who, by the way, was put on the court by Ronald Reagan, uh, made the following statement. We cannot condone the normalization of January 6th U.S. Capitol riot. What people like Kennedy and Trump are doing is normalizing what should not be considered normal by any stretch of the imagination. And what the American people have to do is simply reject this kind of extremism. Uh, so Bobby Kennedy Jr.'s, if Bobby Kennedy, the original, were alive, he'd be rolling over in his grave at the thought of what his son is saying and doing. It's just appalling. It doesn't seem like it's a mistake to me. First of all, how you make that, ty that's not a mistake. That's a thought right? That's not a, oops, we had a typo, and it turns out it means something else. That's a, we put this thought out there in the world. Yeah. He He's says, repudiating it now. He's gotten backlash on it. But look, sorry. he did the same thing with vaccines. Mm -mm. He did the same thing with conspiracy theories. Uh, I've interviewed Bobby Kennedy Jr. several times, uh, and his campaign is alive and well only because of his name. Yeah, And I think we have to differentiate. I told a story the other day. In 1968, I was campaigning uh, for Richard Nixon in Wisconsin. And of course, uh, on the Democratic side, Eugene McCarthy was running for president. And I ran into a, a little old lady who it seemed to me would be a natural Nixon voter. And uh, she had a McCarthy button on. I said, well, you're voting for McCarthy? She said, I voted for old Joe the first time he ran, and I'm voting for him again. And of course, Joe McCarthy had already been dead since 1957, this is 1968, and uh, she was just confusing uh, who Joe McCarthy was versus Gene McCarthy. Right. The same thing is happening with Bobby Kennedy Jr. People are saying, well, he must be his father's son. And uh, look, who he chose for vice president of the United States is his candidate. Inexperienced, also uh, off the wall on a lot of these issues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely ridiculous. So here's the quote. Quote, 
we must free Assange now. The Brits want to make sure our government doesn't kill Assange. This is the reality that every American citizen faces, from Ed Snowden to Julian Assange to the J6 activists sitting in a Washington, D.C. jail cell stripped of their constitutional liberties. You and got wait, it. there's more. He goes on to CNN and he talks to Aaron Burnett, right? And he, he says this, I quote again, Trump, basically, overthrowing, trying to overthrow the election is clearly a threat to democracy, he tells Burnett on this out front show to this week. But the question is, he says, who is a worse threat to democracy? And what I would say is, again, this is uh, RFK Jr. speaking, I'm not going to answer that question. But I can argue that President Biden is because the First Amendment, Aaron, is the most important. I watched that interview. Uh, I commented on it in my uh, own commentary around the political world with John Rockman. And I said it's a disgrace. It's it's horrific. So let, let's let's be clear. Uh, the it's Democrats... It's not a mistake. Are, it's not a mistake. No, it's not a mistake. He, and the he, Democrats he, he are really make, thinks this. The Democrats are going to make the case against Bobby Kennedy Jr. Uh, so am I in my commentary everywhere I speak. And we just have to hope that confusion is lifted. Bobby Kennedy Jr. is a conspiracy theorist. He's off the rails. And I want to tell you, his family, by and large, is opposing him. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and we can just hope his impact is minimal. Uh, well, if his name see. were were Bobby Smith, no one would be paying We any wouldn't attention. be paying attention at all. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the impact, though, because the, the thought was that RFK Jr. was going to hurt the Democrats, right? That it was going to siphon votes away from President Biden that were desperately needed in a time where we need to make sure that democracy actually is safe. Meanwhile, with his ideas on this whole J6 thing and the vaccines, right? I wonder if he's not going to siphon votes away from Trump because those are, that's kind of Trump, very Trumpy. No, I've said that from the beginning. I think he does more damage to Trump than he does to uh, Biden. But remember, in order to do damage, you have to be on the ballot. And Bobby Kennedy Jr. is not going to be on the ballot in all 50 states. Uh, I think he will be a marginal figure. And I think that the uh, uh, facts about who he is and what he represents uh, will derail whatever credibility he has, uh, I hope. Uh, and I would remind you again of Judge Lambert's uh, statement. We cannot uh, condone, condone the uh, rationalization, the normalization of uh, the January 6th insurrection. Uh, he's absolutely right, and we're just going to have to press that on. Although, you know, it's interesting, Kim, January 6th is so long ago in the minds of so many people that they don't remember. They don't remember the assault on American democracy. Uh, I spoke yesterday with an individual who just went to hear... Uh, Liz Cheney speak, and she was here in Northern California. And uh, Liz Cheney received a standing ovation. She received a standing ovation not because uh, she uh, is a mainstream political figure. She isn't. I would never vote for Liz Cheney. She's too conservative for me. Uh, but she received a standing ovation for her political courage in condemning uh, the administration of Donald Trump and what he tried to do. And that's what we, and that you're a, you're not a, a giving commentary yourself. You try to be objective as a news person. I understand that. But this is something that people have to understand, whether it's an RFK Jr. or a Donald Trump. One of the most interesting numbers that I heard today in a poll, and I don't necessarily believe polls, but this was interesting 20% of Republican voters object to Donald Trump as their nominee. If Donald Trump loses 20% of Republicans, he has no chance of being elected president of the United States. And I think that is going to be the simple reality. As long as Kennedy and Trump keep talking, they'll hang themselves. I hope that you're right. But I I feel like the people that said that, the people that are, were like, we can't vote for him. We're not happy he's our nominee. And we're not, you know, we don't support him. <clears throat> Slowly, and you've seen it with the billionaires who want their tax cuts and don't want to pay extra taxes, right? They're slowly coming back into the Trump fold. And that and has I, I don't. Concerned. I don't really... I don't really believe that that will happen. The majority of the American people are too smart for that. And I would remind you that No Labels was supposed to offer an alternative. Right. And No Labels couldn't even get a candidate for president or vice president uh, to uh, go on the ballot. And so what you're seeing at this very moment is the reality that No Labels will have no candidate. That works, by the way, to the advantage of Joe Biden and uh, marginalizes, I think, the probability 
that a third party candidate will really have an impact. So this is also very good news. Uh, I had that on here to talk to you about this whole no labels uh, situation. They were trying to recruit a unity ticket, which I guess what one Republican, one Democrat. They were trying very hard to get they were trying to get Joe Manchin, uh, who was a Democrat, to run on a ticket, say, with Chris Christie, who was a Mm -hmm. Republican. Uh, And everyone they've turned to uh, has said no. Uh, and so there will be no no labels candidate. And by the way, they raised and spent a fortune yeah. trying to get on the ballot everywhere and so forth. So it just goes to show you, it's what I've said before, third parties in America don't win elections. The last third party candidate to be elected president was Abraham Lincoln in 1860. And that was a party built from the ground, uh, from the ground up because Republicans ran candidates in 1856 and 1858 mm-hmm. for the House, for the Senate, for governorships. Uh, and uh, the Democratic Party was divided in three ways in 1860. And uh, there is no phenomenon like that right now. So no labels clearly is a failed venture. Well, I w- and I wonder about that because they asked an awful lot of people, right? They, as you mentioned, Chris Christie turned them down. Um, others that turned them down, Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, uh, former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley and presidential candidate, Senator Joe Manchin, all these people said, no, thank you. They know that if they run, they siphon votes away from the person that, you know, they actually do favor to win. And so do we ever see a no labels type of situation? And also, are we too divided to have a no labels situation? No, you know what it will require? It will require a revolution in American politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are a fundamentally a two-party system, Democrats and Republicans. The problem, Kim, if I can summarize it very simply, is this. Once upon a time, there was a liberal wing and a conservative wing of both the Democrats and the Republicans. Today, there is no liberal wing of the Republican Party, and there is no conservative wing of the Democratic Party. So in the old days, you could reach across the aisle and cut a deal. I equate this with a bird flying. Uh, if you have two wings, a bird can fly. If you clip a wing... The bird doesn't fly. And that's the problem with American politics right now. Uh, We're not flying because we don't have the ability to come together across the aisle, which was something Joe Lieberman, the late Joe Lieberman, did very well. He worked with Democrats and Republicans. In fact, he was such a bipartisan or nonpartisan figure in a sense that he could be Al Gore's running mate in uh, 2000 uh, in the election. And four year, and eight years later, John McCain could want him to be his nominee for vice president on the Republican ticket. Uh, McCain didn't get the nomination, didn't run for the nomination, uh, because uh, he was pro-choice and the Republican Party wouldn't accept a pro-choice candidate. So, I mean, what we have now is such a polarization that it's very, very tough. And let me just point out to you, you and I have talked about the in vitro fertilization question in the past. Yeah. And you'll remember some years ago, I suggested to you with the overthrow of Roe v. Wade, that in vitro would be threatened. And that's what we're seeing now mm-hmm. in states like Alabama and across the country, where, but particularly Alabama, where this has been a, a real issue. Uh, there are polarizing issues in American politics. Uh, and there's no way to bridge that gap. What is reassuring to me is that uh, the question of abortion, for instance, will be on the Florida ballot. Uh, that happened this week. And I believe very strongly that's a tremendous blow to the Republicans because the Republican Party can't even decide that it's in favor of in vitro fertilization. Although to Donald Trump's credit, uh, he has said he is in favor of in vitro and he believes that it ought to be permitted. But they're so far out of the mainstream of American politics. So to have a third party that can be successful, we would really need a revolution in the American political process. And I don't see that happening. You mentioned IVF. And I haven't spoken about this publicly on the air yet because it just hasn't come up uh, when I, we've been talking. But RFK Jr.'s running mate, Nicole Shanahan, did you hear what she had to say about IVF? She said she doesn't believe in it. Why? Because she went to have it and they told her she wasn't a candidate. It drives me crazy when people put their own experience as the experience of the masses, right? Well, look, she clearly is is not somebody who is creditable as a candidate for vice mm-hmm. president. She was chosen only because of her money. She said that in vitro fertilization was an attack on American women, mm-hmm. uh, a fraud being perpetrated on women in America. 
uh, this is uh, this is ludicrous and it's shameful, and she shouldn't be a creditable candidate for vice president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Remember, vice presidents may become president, and for Bobby Kennedy yeah. Jr. to have selected her as his vice presidential running mate just goes to show how how incompetent he is as a political leader. And uh, if his name weren't RFK Jr., he'd be nowhere. She advocates sunshine. Get a few hours of sunshine. You're better off. Yeah. A couple well, things to say. Uh, uh, Luis it, says John Rothman equals conspirator of truth. <laughs> Thanks, JR. <laughs> and then Brian uh, comes in today with $18 saying, uh, John Rothman, whatever change lurks around the corner with this show, we want you to be there with us any way you can. That's my hope. Your contributions to the show are so appreciated. Shalom. I, I appreciate that. And may I yeah. quickly, I know you want to ask me many more questions. Yeah. yeah. Look, uh, it's... A year and a half now since uh, KGO vanished. Yeah. Uh, both Mark Thompson and Nikki Maduro have tried to uh, get this up and running. Uh, mm -hmm. I have contributed. I don't charge them for this. I have mm -hmm. contributed my time and energy to trying to help them succeed. Uh, if we want to have that kind of discourse in the fourth largest media market in the United States, uh, we have to support both Nikki Maduro and Mark Thompson and I promise you that I will take every opportunity to support them and help them. Mm -hmm. And of course, I am on Around the Political World with John Rothman uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday. I don't charge for it. We have 150,000 downloads uh, and we keep growing. But you have to understand, I'm, I'm aware of what it takes to put on a radio program or a internet program, or this kind of program. Mm -hmm. And unless it has the kind of support that it deserves, well, it will die, pure and yeah. simple. Around the Political World with John Rothman is John's podcast. You can search for it on Google. You can hear it where podcasts are heard. And it's 10 minutes about of the mornings, the day's political news. And it's definitely worth your time. Um, do want to thank Marilyn as well for a $5 super sticker. You guys, we really need the contributions and we're really grateful for them. So thank you for that. Now, what okay. else? I know we have a long agenda here, so mm. let's rip through it. Well, we talked about uh, billionaires for a moment and about how they're coming back into the Trump fold, except for this guy. His name is Barry Diller, and he is calling the former president, Trump, scammy. And he's talking about the Trump media situation where the stock was up, the stock is down, the financials of the company are, are hideous, right? And so he calls the Truth Social platform a total scam. He asks CNBC, why are you even talking about this? It's a scam, just like everything he's been involved in is some sort of con. He told this to uh, the folks on Squawk Box on CNBC. Um, he... He's looking at this company, this truth social Trump media situation, and he's saying it's like GameStop. He said it's ridiculous. The company has no revenue. So why are people falling for this? And why are people giving Trump money like this? Same people who gave uh, Trump University credibility yeah. uh, or Trump stakes or, well, you name the, the thing that Donald Trump has gone into. Donald Trump is the Elmer Gantry of American politics. He is a salesman. Uh, he, he trades on his name and his brand. He trades on his reputation. And Donald Trump has no credibility, none at all with me. And I hope that one of the things that happens in this campaign is that the American people will really be exposed to what Donald Trump is. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a fake. He's a phony. He's a fraud. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's the simple truth. We will have more and more people who uh, supported Trump in the past saying that. Look, do I need to remind you that not only has Mike Pence, uh, Donald Trump's vice president, said he'll never vote for Donald Trump, yeah. uh, but you have members, former members of his cabinet, uh, former officials in the Trump administration, including Mike Esper, the former Secretary of Defense, all saying they would never want to see a Trump presidency again. If I were the Democrats, I'd be making commercials featuring each one of those leading personalities saying why they wouldn't vote for Donald Trump again. But, you know, you can fool people, and, and Donald Trump has done that. I want to make a comment. I got a lot of criticism, Kim, when I made a comment that I've considered the people who vote for Donald Trump to be members of a cult. It is a cult. 
It is a cult when you cannot admit that somebody who you admire makes a mistake. Uh, and I have to tell you, uh, that is the greatest flaw of all in the Trump process. So when uh, U.S. District Judge Royce Lambert said, we cannot condone the normalization of January 6th, the U.S. Capitol riot, people should listen to him. He's a Reagan Republican, for God's sake. And what I'm really counting on uh, is the Republicans who have a conscience, the Republicans who understand the true meaning of the Republican Party, standing up and just saying no to Donald Trump. I think the Republicans would be better off losing massively House, Senate, uh, the presidency, so they have to rebuild. Mm. And it's true that about a third of the Republican Party will always believe Donald Trump. But I also want to point out to you, after Watergate, about a third of the Republicans still believed in Richard Nixon. Mm. Uh, it takes a lot to wake people up, to make them understand I tend to think that Trump could have been involved in exactly the same scenario as Watergate and people would still be lining up behind him. Something about this guy. It's funny you mentioned Watergate because, and this is a conversation I remember hearing when I was little or having with my dad when I was little. So I could be getting pieces of it wrong. But I remember my dad talking to me about how there's a duty, maybe he said duty, that people perceive that when you're working for a president, and something goes wrong, you fall on your sword to protect the president. And I remember he used the words fall on your sword, right? So that all of these people that are surrounding the president take the fall so the president doesn't, because that's the most important thing, that the president goes on to do great things, right? The people that surrounded Donald Trump, I don't know if you can say fa are falling on their swords, but they are definitely feeling the repercussions of what being around him while all the these laws allegedly were broken means. And here's another one. We saw recently that um, his attorney, John Eastman, is likely to be disbarred. And now we have this guy. His name is Jeffrey Clark. Here's a picture of him. Acting attorney general. <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey Clark, his apparently bid to aid Trump's election scheme, violated attorney rules. Imagine that. So the DC bar panel is recommending that he be disbarred. They've got a three member disciplinary committee and they say that Clark's efforts to transfer, to upend the transfer of power to, to President Biden, violated his duties as attorney, that he tried to subvert the 2020 election and that violated ethics rules for lawyers. And so this is a preliminary decision and it starts the process that could get him disbarred. And again, he's not the first one to have this happen, but here he is, could lose his profession. He, he went to school for years to do this. Now, look, so, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani's in the same boat. Mm. Uh, all the lawyers who are around Donald Trump are being uh, discredited and being removed. Now, let me ask you the question, Kim. When you have all of this going on with people being disbarred, yeah. does that matter to the Trump voter? I mean, isn't it a sign? Everyone around him is being found to be corrupt, to have violated ethics rules. Does that not shine on the main star? Well, it should. Uh, and that's the whole point of Judge Lambert's comment, that we cannot condone the normalization of what happened on January 6th. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and I, I say this with a deep sense of sadness, the corruption around Trump, the irregularities around Trump are being normalized. People now expect every day there will be another scandal about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And people are willing to overlook that. And that is a flaw in our system. We shouldn't overlook it. Someone of Trump's, well, lack of character should have no business winning the Republican nomination for president of the United States. We mentioned the people around Trump. And I saw this article in Politico, and it's the representatives Andy Biggs and Paul Gosser are being subpoenaed now in this um, investigation in Arizona into the Trump fake electors. I don't think we're really giving this enough attention, this whole fake electors thing. This is down low and dirty. 
This is cheating as plain as day to have fake electors coming in. These people were liars, liars and cheats. And that's why Eastman and Clark may be stripped right. of their law licenses. Mm -hmm. You know, the fake elector thing, I can remember sitting at KGO and all of the paper came into us about, uh, and these were the affidavits themselves, copies. And I remember reading them on the air and saying, I've never seen anything so irregular in my entire life. Uh, and this is election fraud. Right. That's what fraud is all about. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to tell you, when you can prove it, when you can show the facts clearly that fraud was attempted in the election of 2020, and people say, oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, they were just doing an alternative slate of electors. No. And that's the whole point. It was a fraud. It was an attempt to discredit. And you remember something, and I remember something. When Mike Pence, the, when the president of the Senate, is supposed to count the ballots, uh, bring them formally, yeah. and Donald Trump put pressure on Pence to throw them out, uh, to send the ballots back to the states so Trump electors could be certified. Now, I'm no fan of Mike Pence. I want to be perfectly clear. I would never vote for Mike Pence for anything. But Mike Pence was a profile in courage. He mm -hmm. said no. And do you remember the chant in the Capitol? Hang Mike Pence. And do you remember that Donald Trump did nothing, nothing to protect yeah. his vice president? And so all I can tell you is uh, uh, these acts alone should be enough. But you know the problem is, Kim, there's so much. You and I could do 10 hours <laughs> on each one of the things dealing with Donald Trump, and people would say, well, well, but it's enough. I, I can't keep it all straight. I, oh, God. And, and it, it fades, but we can't let it fade. And I, I must tell you, I have great faith. The Biden campaign is going to make this a major issue. They are going to go to the map dealing with Donald Trump and his irregularities. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a good thing, I think. Well, it seems to me, and I don't know why people can't see this, it's like, um, here's what they do. Like, say you're, you're in a grocery store, right? And you're stealing stuff. And you point at that guy. Look over here, Rothman, he's stealing stuff. Meanwhile, I got my pockets jammed full, right? I can't get enough stuff to steal. Ja, look at Rothman, he's stealing. And this is what they're doing. They're, they're, they point to the Democrats and go, fraud. And yet at every turn, the people committing fraud are the Trump people. Yeah, that, that goes to back. Roy Cohen, who is Joseph McCarthy's attorney, uh, later became the attorney for the Trump family. And he developed a very close relationship with Fred Trump, uh, Donald Trump's father, and with Donald Trump himself. And his attitude was, if they accuse you of something, just accuse them of doing the same thing. If they <laughs> like, hit you, just hit them back. It's, a, it's the playbook. Yeah. But but shouldn't we be smart enough to see this as Americans? Every yes. time they say and point a finger and of blame at someone else, it really means they're doing that themselves. Well, yes, of course. From the beginning of this whole Trump thing, that's what mm -hmm. it's meant. Of course. Yeah. But I'm realistic to understand. A majority of the American people understand that. That's the reason Donald Trump will never win the presidency. And I believe with all my heart that Donald Trump will be defeated and resoundingly so. And it's only going to get worse as these court cases mount and as all these issues continue to grow and compound. Yeah. Can you imagine electing a person, president of the United States, who is a sexual predator? Yeah, no. I mean, it's this the whole thing is, is crazy. Yeah. So look, but I believe that sanity will be restored. The uh, nonsense of Donald Trump will be uh, removed. Yeah. And the Republicans are going to have to rebuild. They have another problem, by the way, in the House of Representatives. The Republican Party in the House is completely dysfunctional. I think the Democrats are going to take the House in the election. Hakeem Jeffries will be the next Speaker of the House. Mm. But the reason is, look at the Republicans squabbling among themselves, attacking each other. Can you imagine Marjorie Taylor Greene having a veto? And by the way, look at the Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, who wanted to impeach Joe Biden. And when one of the Democrats finally said, it's time to put up or shut up, mm -hmm. and moved to impeach Joe Biden, he couldn't get a second from the Republicans. Is that wild? Yeah. Because yeah. there wasn't any proof. They know it. They're embarrassing themselves. A couple things you said that I want to respond to. Sure. The first thing is that you think America will come to its senses and vote responsibly and reasonably. And I 
I can't, I don't think we can afford to think that way. And here's why. When you start thinking this way, you don't have the momentum, the passion to get to that ballot box. We have to think Trump's going to be reelected and we've got to fight with everything in us to make sure it doesn't happen. When you start saying, America's never going to go for that. America's too smart for that. Then people stay home and they're like, we're going to, it's going to be fine. I agree with you. It's get not going to be phone. fine. Get it's out the vote be, is the most yeah. important single thing. We have to act like that Trump is imminent, right? Incoming. We have to act like it's a ballistic missile headed our way. That's how I feel. I agree. But back to the the representatives that are now being investigated uh, and actually being subpoenaed, rather. It's Representative Andy Biggs and Paul Gosser. They're two Arizona Republicans. They've got to now testify before a grand jury because... They apparently were among Donald Trump's closest Capitol Hill allies in this scheme. And these are people that are coming right back into Congress. So we have these people that are cheaters and liars that tried to help with this fake elector thing. The um, governor of Arizona, rather the attorney general of Arizona, Chris Mays, who is leading this investigation, um, apparently considering bringing criminal charges possibly against these lawmakers there's no indication of that no no definitive word on that yet but what happens if people that we've we the people of arizona have elected that they have elected what happens if they're they're somehow connected with with trump and the fake electors do they go down or is it a case where we don't care and we're going to send them right back in you know i can't answer that question yeah people have the right to vote for the person who they want to represent them in Congress. But we know that in the case of these two representatives, who we have heard repeatedly making outrageous and egregious statements, Mm -hmm. the people of Arizona, I hope, will be restored to their senses uh, and will repudiate them. But even if they're not repudiated, their records have to be exposed. The nation has to understand who they are. It's like Marjorie Taylor Greene and her campaign in Georgia. These things have to be exposed. And This is part of the problem of the Republican Party. They have to purge themselves, and they have to go into districts and say, this is unacceptable to us as a national party. And uh, Speaker Johnson has been unwilling to do that. Uh, He really is a disgrace as Speaker of the House of Representatives. And uh, I think his tenure will be relatively short, and I think the Democrats will take the House. What is a shame, Kim, is that the Republican Party has allowed itself to get into this depth of, of... lunacy. And I hope the Republican Party restores sanity somewhere along the line and rebuilds itself. Before we talk about migrant children, I just wanted to throw out there because I know it it happened yesterday. And in two cases, the documents case, and I believe the hush money Stormy Daniels case against Trump, the judges refused to toss out charges yesterday. Yep. which means both cases move forward. There was a question mark in Florida in that documents espionage case as to what Judge Cannon would do. But it seems both cases are moving forward, maybe not as quickly as one would have hoped because we would have liked to maybe get some type of resolution before the election so that voters could walk into this eyes open, right? With all the information we need to know who's guilty and who isn't. Yeah, I agree. The clock is ticking on Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And people say the wheels of justice grind slowly. I don't mind as long as they get it right. And as long as the American people are aware and you're exactly right, this is not the only case. Uh, Jack Smith's case uh, will ultimately be heard as well. And the American people need to understand that if that case is heard, when it is heard, and I believe it will be, that Donald Trump will clearly be guilty. And, And there's no question in my mind, but that they're going to call to the witness stand Mike Pence. And whatever you think of Mike Pence, he tells the truth. And if Mike Pence tells the truth, Donald Trump is going to go down. I'm not interested in revenge, Kim. I'm not even interested in uh, in his going to jail. I'm interested in the truth coming out, the American people having to admit that the truth is that Donald Trump is a, uh, a corruption in the American political system. I want people to understand that so it can't happen again. Or at least, at least we will have made sure that when our children and grandchildren read the books of history, they will understand what Donald Trump did to the American political process. I'm glad you mentioned children. This is a 
camp that migrants have set up, little tents there along the river. There's a ruling yesterday, a federal judge ruling that migrant children in these desert camps need to be in safe and clean facilities. Imagine that. Here we are, America, right? And you've got migrant children being held in these open air desert camps. They're in federal custody and they're now required to be expeditiously processed and placed in facilities that are safe and that are sanitary. This comes out of a, a federal judge's court in California who issued, issued the order uh, this week. Her name is Judge Dolly G. And she says U.S. Customs and Border Protection does maintain legal custody over these minors in these open air detention sites. They have decision making authority over the health and welfare of the children at these sites. And she says we've got a duty to keep these folks, these kids in safe and sanitary facilities. I don't know. I mean, does it not make sense that we should treat people better than this? It shouldn't need a court ruling. It ought to be the policy of the United States of America. Uh, we're better than what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when, when Donald Trump talks about a Biden bloodbath uh, on the borders, uh, I don't know what his imagery is. There's no bloodbath, but it is a disgrace. And it's a bipartisan disgrace, Democrats and Republicans both. So we have a real obligation to do that. And, and people say, well, we have our own problems. There's no bigger problem than securing our border making sure that people are treated properly, and particularly when it comes to children. Uh, that's a responsibility. And uh, we have failed it miserably under Democrats and under Republicans. So yeah. I'm glad that the court has ruled the way it did. The judge did the right thing. But we should have done the right thing from the beginning and understood this. This is not new, by the way. Do you remember the whole question of separating parents from children, which came up yeah. uh, during the Obama administration? Uh, Frankly, there are so many injustices that need to be uh, redressed and uh, addressed by the American people. And uh, I hope that we are able to do that in the future. In the meantime, thank God for this judge. We, we treat these people like they're less than human. Well, that's I what Donald Trump said, that they're animals, remember? Right. I, and I understand that we can be frustrated at the pace of which migration is happening. We can be frustrated that people are here against the law, right? We can be frustrated by the system that allows all of this to happen and that it's not working for us. But when you, you look at the people involved, we at least have to respect humanity and not treat people, we treat them like garbage. I agree. And that's why when Donald Trump refers to them as animals, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I find it particularly offensive when Donald Trump says that immigrants pollute the blood of America. May I ask everyone who is listening, unless you're Native American, every person listening is the son or daughter descendant of immigrants to this country. Mm -hmm. Did your coming here pollute the blood of America? This kind of rhetoric is a disgrace. The fact that it comes from a man who was once president of the United States is even more distressing and that it comes from a man who would be president of the United States, well, that's why we have to stop him. And uh, I agree with Kim, and I want to underline this. The Democrats raised a heck of a lot of money this last week when there was a joint appearance by Obama, uh, by Biden, and by Clinton. And uh, they raised that money, and somebody asked, what are they going to spend it on? I hope it's a get-out-the-vote drive. Yeah. I hope it's uh, ads that expose what really is going on. I hope they spend that money uh, to impress the American people with this thing. And that includes, by the way, the supporting Democrats uh, for the House of Representatives. Uh, this is the kind of thing that is so clear to me. I mean, it's clear to us, Kim. Uh, I'm not sure it's clear to the American people. Before I let you go, I think another thing they could spend that money on is really getting the word out about stuff like this. This is a jobs report that came out. This that, morning. This, this morning. This morning. Well, uh, maybe last night. It showed that the U.S. economy added 303,000 jobs last month, which exceeded expectations in every way. And I feel like people are still saying, oh, the economy will be better under Trump. But look at what President Biden is happening under President Biden, right? 
So the expectation was that we would have 205,000 new jobs added, and we instead had 303,000 new jobs added. The unemployment rate fell to 3.8%. This is all due to, uh, well, it's all because of, this is data from the uh, Labor Department. And the markets were higher today. I, I just, how do we get the word out to people that things are turning around, the economy is doing better than it has? I was listening this morning. The report actually was published at 5.30 this morning, our time. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, Biden and the Democratic administration deserve credit for the fact that there is a constant improvement. Uh, and this is something, well, that's why the Republicans are not talking about the recession anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not talking about uh, the downers of that economic recession, which we were in. Yeah. Uh, the economy is recovering, and it's recovering strongly. Uh, the American economy is the uh, engine of the world's economy, and we just have to keep going forward. Will the Democrats get the message out? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, the Republicans say, well, maybe that's true, but when I go to the supermarket, everything costs me more. And the answer is, it takes a while, but I think the Democrats are going to get great credit for this recovery, and they deserve it. Certainly better than the trickle-down economics practiced by the Republicans. I always forget when I'm working into the wee hours, two o'clock in the morning here is is definitely the next day. So you're absolutely right. Well, I get up, you know, I get up very <laughs> early in order to do this. And, and uh, I, I'm a news junkie. And my wife will tell you in the middle of the night, I turn on the news because I want to know what's going on. Uh, there's always something. But this report came out and rather than being denigrated, it ought to be applauded. Right. Republicans ought to be thrilled. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and I hope that we embrace that. But you know, that's not what Trump wants to embrace. He doesn't want the economy to do well. He doesn't want the situation with the uh, migrants at the border to be fixed. He killed the bill in the House of Representatives. <laughs> that's right. He, he said, we can't give Biden a win. Uh, this is a man who doesn't care about America. That's he right. only cares about himself. Yeah. And uh, we need to understand it. But you're right, Kim. Yeah. We have to stay on top of it. We have to keep talking about it. And that's why it's so important that the Nikki Maduro program and uh, the Mark Thompson program and other media in which we participate in uh, need to continue uh, to do what they do. What's on the around the political world with John Rothman show today? Today, we dealt with uh, no labels. We dealt with RFK Jr. We dealt with the 20% of the Republicans who said they won't vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. And I emphasize the Judge uh, Lambert's statement, we cannot condone the normalization of January 6th U.S. Capitol a riot. More than that, I talked about artificial intelligence and the fact that in terms of what's going on in the Middle East right now, it appears that the Israelis have relied on artificial intelligence for targeting and that the report I heard, and I listened to the man who wrote the report, is that sometimes human beings spent only 20 seconds on the uh, reports that came in from human intelligence. Right. This, is a, this is a disgrace. Artificial intelligence is more important uh, to understand, but human intelligence is what carries the day. And this is a valuable lesson, not just for the Israelis, but for the United States of America. We need to be aware that uh, you artificial intelligence is a crutch or it's an mm. assistance but what matters is the human mind and what we do on the ground and we can see in the tragic situation in gaza the israelis at least had the courage to stand up and say they made a mistake and th it's a tragic mistake are and they, they say, are they saying the mistake was made because of their use of ai no okay there but that's part of it part of it evidently from the news report but two uh, officers in the Israeli army were canned today mm -hmm. because of that error, and a third may be canned. It doesn't make up for the fact that the tragedy took place. She uh, Chef Andreas' wonderful work needs to be applauded and understood, yeah. but we also understand the words of Robert McNamara, the former Secretary of Defense, who talked about the fog of war. If you and I recounted all of the mistakes that the United States military has made on the ground, in recent wars, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. But the Israelis are being blamed, I think, incorrectly. Uh, the blame for all of this lies with what happened on October 7th. And it's hard to believe it is six months, coming up on six months, uh, that that horrific attack took place. I want to tell you, there's nothing that bothers me more than the fact that women's groups today are excusing the sexual abuse that was inflicted 
on Israeli and Jewish women by Hamas. There is no excuse for the use of sexual violence. And uh, uh, this is part of, of the problem. Uh, I talked recently with friends in Israel who are very far to the left and who are great critics of Benjamin Netanyahu and who would never vote for Netanyahu. Uh, but they're afraid. They're afraid of the fact that the hatred of Israelis, the hatred of Jews is so real. There's a political science conference going on right here in San Francisco this weekend. And the session on the prospects for Middle East peace was canceled, canceled, because they were afraid of demonstrations. Yeah. This is the United States of America, for God's sake. Yeah. Freedom of speech prevails. I believe in freedom of speech. Yeah. And I believe that when you have academic conferences or incidents like we are now having at the University of California at Berkeley and on campuses across the country, where free speech is being restricted, where uh, Jew hatred is being promoted, and where uh, this bashing of Israel, no matter what Israel does, it's, 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 look, you can be a critic of Israel. I tell people, you want to understand criticism of Israel? Just read the Israeli press. The Israeli press takes on all of this, frankly, in a more candid way than the United States press very often deals with our own issues. So I, I had to mention that because I am concerned about something, Kim. I'm deeply concerned about uh, the double standard that exists. But more than that, I'm very concerned about artificial intelligence and how it's being used. Uh, I know that it's something we are going to have for the rest of our lives. But I know that when you and I sat in the newsroom, uh, when we were on the radio, uh, we had to think before we spoke. True. And now what I'm finding is that a lot of people don't think before they speak. And yeah. human intelligence is being replaced by something that is not normal in terms of understanding the news. I agree with most of what you said, except that everything that's happened is being blamed on that initial attack. And I teach my kids this. You can't control what other people do, but you can control how you react to it, right? And so at some point you have to accept responsibilities for how you're reacting to things. And if it seems over the top, as Nikki said yesterday, overkill, right? If it seems unfair or you're targeting people that are trying to be the helpers, that you're making egregious errors, then I think you have to look inward and not place the blame on, well, they attacked us. Well, look at how you're responding to this. Oh, and I maybe agree. There's something that we could fix here because this is not the right type of, I agree. of thing we the, want to see. That's what the Israelis are saying. Yeah. Uh, they admit they made a mistake. When you fight a war, there are mistakes that are made. Innocent people die. They're not trying to hide that. They're, they're mm -hmm. accepting responsibility. It doesn't obviate what happened. But please understand, today, we didn't talk about this. Uh, there is an existential threat, destruction of Israel. Uh, the Israelis are fighting back because they believe that they are in trouble. And let me assure you, their intention is not what some call genocide against the Palestinian people. If Israel wanted to commit genocide, every Palestinian would be dead. They'd have the ability to do that. The Israelis have, in fact, used greater restraint in this war of dealing with civilians than most armies do. But when you have an enemy that embeds itself with civilians, that operates under schools and mosques and hospitals, which uses hospitals as base points for attack, you know, underneath the UNRWA headquarters, you know what they found? The Hamas Central Command. I mean, I don't know how you fight that. I don't know what you do except to, to fight back. But I, I want to tell you one of the most important single things is the Israelis have had the courage, which most nations don't have, to admit when they make a mistake. And that's what they've done. So it's not a defense of war by any stretch. Yeah. And it's not even a defense of Israel in terms of everything it does. But it is to say that... We now have an international situation of tremendously explosive potential. The Israelis hit a military target in Damascus. They took out two key Iranian generals. Now, they did it because those generals have been responsible for, frankly, terror throughout the Middle East. It may result in a reaction by Iran. The Israelis understand that. But they're fighting for their survival. It's an existential threat. I was with a group of Israelis who are very far to the left just the other day, who remarked how fearful they are going out at night. In fact, one Israeli, actually very responsible young man, now has a gun.
because he feels he has to protect his family. Uh, this is not a rational war. And I understand that. But the Israelis are now in a position where they believe, rightly or wrongly, that if they roll over, Hamas will win. Somebody talked to me the other night about a two-state solution, uh, which I frankly have favored for, well, five decades. Uh, but can you imagine if Hamas controlled the West Bank? Israel, at its narrowest, was nine miles wide. Can you imagine if Hamas controlled the West Bank? And if, if there were a two-state solution, Hamas would have controlled the West Bank. So the Israelis have to think about their own survival. Yeah. And you're absolutely right that how people respond in crisis is critical. Yeah. But it doesn't obviate that nation's right to exist. Otherwise, the United States would have forfeited our right to exist many times over, just dealing with Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Lori writes, Netanyahu has to go. Uh, yes. His policies are destroying Israel and Israel's image in the world. Yes, but may I assure you of something? Netanyahu is going to go. All the polls indicate an overwhelming defeat. But if he's replaced by, let's say, Lapid, who is, seems to be the, the favorite at the moment, or mm -hmm. Gantz, who is also a possibility, their policy is no different. Netanyahu didn't cause what happened on October 7th. Uh, Netanyahu is not the cause of Hamas. Hamas was created long before Netanyahu was a factor. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remember what the Haditha says. It's in, it's in the Hamas covenant. If a Jew should hide behind a rock or a tree, let the rock or the tree cry out, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. Mm -hmm. That is what the Israelis understand as an existential threat. And mm -hmm. this is not a defense of Benjamin Netanyahu. There is no defense for his conduct in many, many levels. And I believe when the Israeli people go to the polls, uh, he will be overwhelmingly rejected. But the people who will replace him, Hamas hates them just as much. And that's the problem. Vilma writes, as a supporter of the Jewish people, how can you excuse famine that there is no excuse? I don't excuse famine, but I will tell you what I do know, that the Hamas has hijacked, taken supplies to go to people in Gaza, that weapons have been smuggled into Gaza in some of those food transports. It's a matter of public record. And I would remind you that when the reason Gaza has all these underground tunnels is because Israel and the world provided concrete for the construction of homes. And what was that concrete used for? It was used to build tunnels uh, for the purpose of destroying Israel. Uh, I understand there's nothing worse than the idea of famine, nothing worse than the suffering of children. Mm -hmm. And if I could figure out a way, and that's the problem, to separate Hamas from the Palestinian people in Gaza, it would be great. Yeah. But if they, Hamas, embed themselves with the people, embed themselves with structures underneath hospitals and schools and mosques, what are the Israelis supposed to do? As one Israeli said to me, we are not going to roll over and play dead, yeah. pure and simple. And I understand their point. John Rothman, what a pleasure to have you on the show today. I look forward to Fridays just because I get to sit around and chit chat with you. And will you please... I want everybody to know that I support fully the Nikki Maduro program. I support fully uh, Kim McAllister. I regret that this is not interactive in the sense of listeners being able to call and express their point of view. Mm -hmm. We have to keep this venue going. And I urge the support of both the Nikki Maduro program and the Mark Thompson program. And uh, will you please give Kim, uh, Tim Sika my <laughs> warmest good wishes I and will. tell him, I wish we had an hour to pontificate <laughs> on all of the issues. Well, you have the link. If he'll be here at 1030, if you want to pop on back in, you're always welcome on this show. Well, it's an open door policy. I so. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, John Rothman. And my have love a... to your daughter. Tell Julia. Thank I you. Hope, I hope she just had the best, best, best time. Thank you. My love to your family as well. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Stay dry over there. Bye. Bye. I took myself out and didn't remove you. John Rothman, everybody, here on the Nikki Maduro Show. So glad to uh, to have him here. We're very, very fortunate to have him swing by the show and the Mark Thompson show as well. So I was reading all of your um, words in the chat and caught caught up at the end. So I tried to throw a few of him, them toward John Rothman. But thank you for your participation in the show and all the words that you um, have written today. I appreciate that. Okay, here's this story. 
I want to make sure as we sit here and drink our morning coffees and teas that you have all the information you need. You drink decaf coffee? Uh-oh. Here comes this study, and I am not happy to see it. <laughs> this study says that the way caffeine is removed from coffee in some cases is not the way we want to go. Let me explain further. This is a story about solvent, about the way we do things and how we have no care for human health. Let's just support big business. So maybe decaf seems harmless. Hey, all it is is coffee without the caffeine, right? But the way that we suck the caffeine out of the coffee is the problem. Often, the decaffeination process involves using this chemical. It's called, sounds like a little old lady's name, methylene. The chemical is methylene chloride, and it's a colorless liquid used in certain industrial processes, including paint stripping, paint remover manufacturing, metal cleaning, degreasing. It's also used in some pharmaceutical manufacturing as well. This according to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. The problem is good old methylene chloride is a known carcinogen. The National Institutes of Health National Toxicology Program, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the World Health Organization know this. And still it's used. Right? So the FDA filed petitions for consideration in December, and they're still taking public comment on this. But in addition to being carcinogenic, methylene chloride can cause other health harms, liver toxicity, at higher exposures, neurological effects, and in some cases, death. Mmm, let's drink that. Drink up. The risks are in the context of external acute exposure to high levels of this chemical or ingestion of the chemical on its own, right? So the EPA banned it for use as a paint stripper in 2019. In 2023, the EPA proposed a ban of its sale for other consumer uses and industrial and commercial uses as well. But food is regulated by the FDA, right? And they didn't ban it. The State Assembly in California, which often leads the way in these things, recently introduced a bill looking to ban methylene chloride in the decaffeination process. How interesting that we could, uh, with one hand over at the EPA, ban it in paint stripping, Meanwhile, it's still being used to make decaffeinated coffee, and the FDA falls short. The Environmental Defense Fund and others say that by allowing methylene chloride in food, the FDA has been disregarding a 66-year-old addition to the federal act called the Delaney Cause Clause. The Delaney Clause requires the FDA to ban food additives proven to cause cancer or induce cancer when ingested by humans or animals. The, one of the doctors involved says these chemicals categorically cannot and should not be deemed as safe. So the FDA has it all under review. They don't comment on things under review, they say. The... They have one regulation, the FDA, for allowing the use of methylene chloride as a solvent to decaffeinate coffee. The residues of methylene chloride can't exceed 10 parts per million in decaffeinated roasted coffee, in decaffeinated soluble coffee extract. So they have set a limit on it. While methylene chloride may be indirectly involved in food processing, like the decaffeination of coffee beans, residue limits have been set to limit exposure, according to the FDA, and any food product that contains residues of methylene chloride above those limits aren't permitted for sale. Is that good enough for you? 
one of the researchers says the FDA's policy on this is old and outdated, that there's more information now on the toxicity of methylene chloride and at the levels with which it causes toxicity. And it's more recent information about the coffee we drink as well. It used to be you had a little cup of coffee, right? It was what, six, eight ounces? Now we go to Starbucks and order the grande or whatever it is. And a big giant cup of coffee. We're drinking more coffee than we have before. We're getting more of this stuff, right? There apparently, (laughs) some people say, There's not conclusive research that ingesting residual levels in coffee will cause cancer or other problems. But do you want it in you? I don't want it in me. Mm -mm. Methylene chloride has long been commonly used in the decaf industry. Some companies, though, are doing things differently already. So, and here's the interesting thing, and here's a way you can protect yourself if you're a decaf drinker. So Starbucks has three ways they remove caffeine. They've got the natural decaffeination process, which uses liquid carbon dioxide forced into stainless steel tanks at high pressure to draw out and then dissolve the caffeine. Then they have the Swiss water process, which decaffeinates the beans by soaking them in warm water. The warm warm water takes on the flavor of the beans. It's run through an activated charcoal filter that grabs the caffeine molecules, and then the beans are soaked back in the water to reintroduce flavor. But the direct contact method is commonly most commonly used, and that does involve a, a solvent. They're not saying which solvent at Starbucks, but a solvent that along with other liquids used is ultimately evaporated by the beans being steamed, washed and roasted at over 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The way to protect yourself, they say, is to look and do your research about what you're drinking. Always buy, when you buy decaf coffee, look for the packaging with labels like solvent-free, Swiss water processed, or certified organic. Those three things. So again, when you're buying your decaf coffee, if you do decaf, you're looking for solvent-free or Swiss water processed or certified organic. And that can help you out and help keep you away from good old methylene. Nobody likes her. Or you could switch it up. Substances that are caffeine-free include beverages made from chicory root, figs, barley, dandelion root, mushroom elixirs, which Nikki tried on the show and liked, uh, cacao, ruibos, and yerba mate. So there's some alternatives for you. I just wanted to make sure as we sit here with our coffee in hand, right, that we all are on the same page. Because who knew? I mean, I guess it's not surprising to me that the FDA and the EPA would be doing different things and not communicating. But here's the EPA saying, this isn't even safe to be used in stripping paint. And we're over here putting it in our coffee. What in the world? I'm telling you. Um, Lori says, if you've ever taken organic chem, you know that volatile chemicals needed to distill away organic compounds from other organic compounds, acetone, ether, benzene, uh, good distillation compounds. Okay, I don't know exactly what you're trying to say, but I'm assuming you're on the side of no methylene chloride in your coffee, right? Now, Phineas says, it doesn't surprise me when Roundup is still being sold. Wild. Um... Blue Spark says maybe decaf Folgers will take paint off as good as the old paint remover, right? <laughs> Definitely the more you know segment. Yeah, it's true. Well, you know, people go through life and we just assume things are safe. This is America. They wouldn't sell us anything horrible for us. And it turns out these guys over here are, are aware and these guys over here aren't doing anything about it. Frustrating. Frustrating frustrating to me. All right. Blue spark. I love this. Um, This is really dumb. 
Blue Spark says, I can buy some pretty nasty chemicals at the hardware store, but not denatured alcohol. Huh. Yeah, buy it in Oregon. I don't know. No. All right, well, so much for the morning decaf. Maybe I'd rather drink caffeinated coffee anyway. I don't know. Um, let's do a little bit of news, how about? In just a few minutes, we welcome Tim Sika. Before we do that, um, I wanted to talk about this hunger strike going on in San Francisco, and it's all because of a bike lane. Um, hopefully, we'll get to the 99 cent stores winding down their business as well. But first, let's talk about news. And here it is. I can do it. I can do it. Now, it from around the world to up your street, the Nikki Maduro Show presents News Czar Kim McAllister. Right now, there are engineering teams out in force, and they are assessing the damage after this morning's magnitude 4.8 earthquake in New Jersey. That's where it was centered. New York Governor Kathy Hochul saying the teams are looking for any structural damage to the subways, the buildings, and the other areas. There are no reports of injuries or damage, but a 4.8 in New Jersey. That's a new one. President Biden has been briefed on this magnitude 4.8 quake that hit the Northeast. The White House says the president is in touch with his team. They are monitoring potential impacts, and the administration is in contact with both state and local authorities there. That tremor, again, was felt throughout the Northeast, including New York City. They said they felt it from Pennsylvania to New York. Hmm. Well, <laughs> welcome to California, everybody. Congress returns from recess next week with a very busy to-do list. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer will have to deal with the articles of impeachment against Homeland Secretary uh, Security Alejandro Mayorkas that will come from the Republican-led House. Lawmakers will also have to address additional aid for Ukraine, funding to help rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and the potential ban on the social media app TikTok. So that's some of the things on their plate. Again, as mentioned earlier here on the Nikki Maduro Show, the monthly jobs report is surpassing expectations. The Labor Department reports the economy added 303,000 new jobs in March. That far exceeds the 200,000 most analysts had uh, forecast. The unemployment rate saw little change coming in at 3.8%. So the economy doing better. A new study finds the Bay Area's dedication to electric vehicles is actually having a positive impact on the region's carbon footprint. This study out of UC Berkeley found the Bay Area saw carbon emissions reduction of just under 2% in the years 2018 and 2022. Scientists attributing that decrease to the large number of electric vehicles being used around the Bay Area, and they say this decrease is small, but it's steady, and it's a very good start as California as a whole looks to eliminate its carbon footprint by the year 2045. Very excited to announce one of the authors of that study will be here on the Nikki Maduro Show on Tuesday. We'll have uh, Naomi Azamal on the show, and very excited to hear a little bit more about that study and what it means for the Bay Area. A plan has been hatched to celebrate the incoming arrival of the new peregrine uh, falcon chicks at UC Berkeley. They call it Hatch Day, and it's being held April 24th. It'll feature live streaming of the hatching of four eggs laid by the school's resident peregrine falcon, Annie, atop the famous bell tower on campus, the Campanile. Annie has lived in a nest on the tower since 2016, and recently has mated with a male falcon, the community named Archie. Four eggs were soon spotted in the nest, and experts have estimated that they will hatch on or around April 24th. The school will live stream the nest on the outdoor screen of the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Experts will also be on hand to discuss information about falcons throughout the day. So, hatch day, April 24th. Airbnbs are booked up in the path of totality from Monday's solar eclipse. According to the short-term rental analytics platform AirDNA, occupancy rates spiked to 88% in those locations. The rare celestial site will arc over 15 states, and it's very good for business, apparently. This report is sponsored by you which means we rely on you to help us fund the Nikki Maduro show. It's a crowdfunded operation over here. Please find us. Oh, I'm still around the political world with John Rothman. Would you look at that? 
Um, please find us at the Nikki Maduro show.com. Again, the Nikki Maduro show.com is where the Patreon and the PayPal links are located. And thank you for all the ways you support the show. I'm also not sorry that I left the John Rothman banner up during the newscast because you know what? More advertisement for around the political world with John Rothman as well. I'm Kim McAllister. This is the Nikki Maduro show. All right, we're back into it. Let's talk about, um, this situation with the hunger strike in San Francisco. And this is all over a bike lane because the bike lane is coming on Valencia street and it goes right down the middle of the street and business owners are saying this could drive away business. The bike lane apparently means the loss of those parklets that businesses put up during the pandemic that helped them survive. Two parklets for one business lost. Uh, the owner of one of these businesses, his name is Aid Eltawell, and he says this hunger strike is his last resort. He said the suffering of trying to survive every month is way more than this. Sometimes he says he doesn't sleep. Sometimes he doesn't eat. So instead, he's planning to go on a 30-day hunger strike to protest the center bike lane and the two parklets he lost after that bike lane was installed. They took away his parklets and they put in a parking meter. Um, he, along with two other business owners on Valencia Street, filed claims against San Francisco saying the presence of this bike lane is violating their rights and hurting the economic vitality of the area. Lawyer uh, representing the business owner says it violates the client's rights, also violates the city's charter, which mandates that the city protect the economic welfare of its businesses. He said the center bike lane has been a catastrophic failure to the businesses along Valencia Street. They're already building it. It's already happening. But Elta will the business owner who's going on the hunger strike says he's really hoping for a change. He said this whole thing, the hunger strike, may be his last resort. He said he doesn't know how long he can go. He's got a lot of loans. He's in debt. He said, I just want to fight before I go away. So this is his last stand against this. He's tearful as he talks to ABC7 saying it's not fun. It's not. He said he's just trying to provide for his family. 200 businesses along Valencia Street have taken a stand against this bike lane. So they're asking for the immediate removal. I don't know. I understand that it's important that we have a safe place for cyclists to roll through in San Francisco, right? We want people to be able to bike to work safely. But we also have to respect these businesses. If we're taking away their parklets and we're taking away their ability to succeed and thrive in a city that's losing business right and left, I mean, Sayonara Macy's, right? And Nordstrom's. Big business, small business. Do we have a duty to protect it? Yeah. So the SFMTA did say they... um offered a parklet permit to enter Will, but that he would need to remove it every day outside of one of his businesses. So he's going to protest in the space with an unpermitted parklet that he built. Um, and if he says they want to come remove it, they're going to have to come remove it with him in it. Uh, he said, I'll put a tent out here and I'll do the 30 days in the parklet. So, Here's a guy who's trying to fight for his existence, and I feel horrible that he has to go through this, right? I wish someone in San Francisco would hear him and try to come up with some solution that's viable for him. Like, here's a guy trying to survive. I mean, if if you don't think that going on a hunger strike, setting up a tent in your parklet, he's going to massive extremes to make this work, to stay in business in San Francisco. So... 99 cent stores are also winding down their business. 
We saw this with the dollar store, right? They started closing all their businesses, not all of them, but many of them across America. You, I always wondered how they could sell things so cheaply and still stay, stay in business. But 99 cents only is the name of the store. They are closing down all their stores and they are winding down their business operations. So this is a discount chain in California, Texas, Arizona, and Nevada. And they say, like many retailers, coming out of this pandemic has been a real struggle. They've got rising costs and they have something called shrink. Shrink is higher merchandise losses from customer errors, damage, internal losses, and of course, shoplifting. So they're dealing with shrink. And I think when you're probably on a very tight profit margin already, the shrink is going to be a real problem. The quote from the 99 cents people is that this was an extremely difficult decision and it's not the outcome that they expected or hoped for. The, according to Mike Simonsick, who's the interim chief executive officer of 99 cents, he said, unfortunately, the last several years have presented significant and lasting challenges in the retail environment, including the unprecedented impact of the pandemic, shifting consumer demand, rising levels of shrink, persistent inflationary pressures, and other macroeconomic headwinds. All of that has hindered the company's ability to operate. So they entered into an agreement with this financial services company to liquidate the merchandise starting on Friday. They'll also work to get the rid of the fixtures, the furnishings, the equipments at all of their 371 stores. Now, I'm not a fan of the dollar store thing. I think um, it's good for some things if you're trying to buy, you know, cups and um, paper plates for classrooms, it can be good. But overall, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it's the people who shop at the 99 cent stores. I, I don't know. I feel like there's a lack of quality there. I could be wrong, right? But I would rather buy less, but buy something I can believe in than buy more and spend less for it, if that makes any sense at all. So, the 99 cent situation likely won't affect me because I didn't go to those stores very often. Um, but I'm sure there are people that count on that, that feel like the, you know, they can't afford to go into a grocery store and walk out with three items that cost way more than anything they could have purchased at the 99 cent place. So, um, and this one, because of Nikki going to Las Vegas, do you hear the Tropicana is going to be brought down? They're going to implode it in late 2024. This is a building owned by the Bally's Corporation, and it's been standing in Las Vegas since the 1950s. They call it a relic. They're going to implode it sometime in October. They're not saying exactly how these two towers will come down. Uh, Controlled Demolition is the name of the company. They have a lot of Las Vegas demolitions that they've done in the past. They say um, they've got a checklist of requirements before the implosion, securing dust control, asbestos abatement permits, creating crowd and traffic control plans, even securing a special events permit. Maybe they can get Mark Thompson to go MC the implosion of the Tropicana. I I hope Nikki takes note as she's rolling by. She can see it standing, right? The last time she'll ever see it. Uh, but yeah, later this year. They say there's a lot of ground to cover um, before they do it, but it's coming down, the Tropicana. And I, I guess, I mean, there's a lot of problems with the building, perhaps? Or is it that we always have to have something new and shiny? What's wrong with embracing old buildings. If we knock down something every time it, it, you know, goes out of fashion, then we wouldn't have all the Victorians in San Francisco. And we wouldn't have all the beautiful old buildings in downtown San Francisco. Are we losing something by just tearing these buildings down like this? 
because it feels like maybe we're losing a little bit of history. Now, Las Vegas is different than other places that maybe embrace their history. You know, maybe you don't need a lot of historical buildings in Las Vegas. I don't know. Or maybe, you know, this is where they're putting the A's ballpark. Not. I don't know. It just seems like the, you know, the minute they're, they want to build a brand new tower, they're imploding something that maybe has some significance. I don't know. I do have some people to thank today, and that includes Luis with the $20 super sticker. Uh, don't know where the show is going, but I know where we've been. Thank you, Nikki Kim, the entire Nikki Maduro online community for a fabulous daily adventure into fun knowledge advocacy and the exchange of ideas onward. Oh, Luis, I adore you. Thank you for the wonderful comments for the $20 super sticker and your consistent support of this show. Very appreciate it. Uh, also, with a four, $5 super sticker, Irony, a guy who claims to be law and order and stokes fear that people are uh, at the border are criminals who he himself is facing 95 indictments. It's the truth. Spencer with a $5 super sticker. Spencer, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Cindy coming in with a $7 super sticker. My religious holiday Giants opening day. Woo! Enjoy listening to your shows and John Rothman whenever I can. Well, Cindy, thank you for listening and watching and being here and supporting the show. Brian came in earlier with this $18 super sticker. Thank you for that. Uh, also with uh, another two bucks for Luis. Thank you very much. And Marilyn with $5 as well. The way you support the show, the way you're always here for us, it really warms my heart. So thank you very much for it. Nikki and I both appreciate that. And I would like to talk to you for a moment about someone else supporting the Nikki Maduro show. And that is our sponsor, Auntie Tobbies, who is making this amazing Jamaican sauce, hot sauce, barbecue sauce, what have you. And sometimes it's in the morning, it's hard to think about sauce. But I hope that you will, especially if you're a fan of the hot sauce. And I have a brother in law who loves hot sauce. This guy puts Tabasco on everything. So I'm going to buy him some of this. You know, I can't handle any heat at all. I'm such a wimp when it comes to heat. But I have people in my family who love it. And I want to support Auntie Tobby's for supporting the Nicky Maduro show. And so that I will do. So it's the hibiscus hot sauce. It is the pineapple hot sauce. And I'll ask for his review. I'll let you know what he says. And this one I may order from myself. This is the barbecue sauce guava style. Now, we had someone that used it and said there is a little bit of a kick to it. I'm still going to try it. And I'm sure the people, the rest of the people in my family will absolutely love it, even if there's too much of a kick for me. Because when I say I'm a wimp, I mean like full blown wimp. Like, I can't handle any heat at all. But I'm going to try it anyway and see how it goes. Thank, thank you to Auntie Tobbies for supporting the show, for becoming a sponsor. We appreciate that very much. And thanks to everyone who's ordered it, who's tried it. Let's see if anyone has. Um, Chris says, I've eaten a whole bottle of sriracha. Can't taste the pepper anymore. Yeah. Gordon's like, no heat for me. Ms. Organics got it, but hasn't tried it yet. Okay, well, when you do, let me know what you think. I can't wait to hear. So, uh, you are correct. Uh, they said late 2024, Phineas. Um, but you're correct. I think they say it's going to go up in a dust implosion in late 2024. I think that's because we're going to go through the summer and it's going to happen in October. So later this year. So that's why they mean late 2024. Okay. Now that that's settled, how about we move on to movies? Movies! It means Tim Seek is coming. I'm always so excited to welcome him to the Nikki Maduro Show. It is Tim Seeka. <laughs> how you doing? Hi, Kim. How are you? <laughs> I'm really good. Thanks for coming on the Nikki Maduro Show on this Friday. I look forward to it every week. Oh, me too. It's one of the high points of my week, I have to admit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have reviewed this movie called Monkey Man. And I've never heard of it before. 
Really? So, okay, so you haven't been what you haven't seen any of the previews. I have seen no preview. I come into this completely blind. And oh so, boy, okay. What's going well, on with Monkey Man? Tell yeah, me all about it. Yeah, Monkey Man. Well, yeah, if you well, you haven't seen the previews. I was gonna say the movie actually the movie not only lives up to the preview trailer, it outdoes it by oh. <laughs> like, oh my god, this movie. You know, I I'm still reeling from having seen it. It was really? that effective. Yeah, it's a thousand percent visceral, it's a thousand percent kinetic. It's bloody, it's violent, it's mm. ugly. It's kind of weirdly beautiful though in all its ugliness, but it's also a masterful uh, piece of filmmaking. It's basically an action thriller, okay? Which marks the directorial debut of actor Dev Patel, who also produces, he writes, and he stars in this story about a man who is out to avenge the death of his mother. Mother. Um, that's basically, it's a pretty simple and straightforward premise. Dev Patel plays the lead character who as a boy witnessed the horrible murder of his mother by a, a corrupt government basically. And that's really, that's all in terms of plot that's really going on here. The story takes place in India, uh, but was actually shot in Indonesia, which I think is a testament to the filmmaking because it's very evocative as a piece. I mean, it looks like we're in India, uh, but anyway, I, I read that it was actually shot somewhere else anyway because of the pandemic. They had all kinds of issues when making this movie. There were all kinds of setbacks. People quit. Anyway, that's another story. Oh, wow. But this movie, <laughs> it, it, it takes the action thriller to a higher level than even the John Wick films dared to go. Uh, the, this, as to the story, it's ugly and violent, but it's such bravura filmmaking, which, you know, uh, I, when I went to see this movie, I was seeing a lot of movies during the week, and this was like the fifth one I think I saw, and I was really, really tired, and like five minutes into it, I'm, I... <laughs> It was like somebody like shot a bolt of electricity through me, and I, I defy anyone to fall asleep if they watch this movie, <laughs> if during the movie to fall asleep, because okay. the film the film editing alone is just gobsmack uh, gobsmacking. There were uh, three editors are credited, and it must have been hell to put this together. But uh, despite the fact, Kim, that it's peppered with Hindu religious iconography. I don't know if it amounts to much other than maybe like a cocaine addled adrenaline rush. So if, if that's what you go to movies for, this could be your ticket to paradise. But I can't deny the overall effect you get from watching this movie, which is you just keep going, wow, wow, wow. I mean, it's like it just it keeps topping itself in terms of the action the brutality and the violence and all the fighting and stuff. My takeaway from the story, if there's any meaning in it to be had at all, is that it's some sort of trans allegory and possibly a timely political allegory of some sort, because there's a definite there's a there's a false prophet in this story masquerading as a holy man. You can fill in the blanks on that. But and it's about fighting for a purpose as opposed to fighting for fighting's sake. You know, the Camelot thing of not might is right, but might for right kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's a symphony of blood and violence and broken bones. Usually not to my liking, but the filmmaking is some of the most revered filmmaking seen this year, and it never, ever, or hardly ever lets up. So it's an unqualified recommendation from me. I have to recommend this movie. It's, uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like screen adrenaline that just seeps into your pores and psychs you out in this indescribable way. I thought it was amazing. I just, yeah. But would you, um, say yeah. It's a, would you say it's blood, gore, and violence that's worth it? Because sometimes it's not. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I would mm -hmm. say, I would give it the benefit of the doubt and say yes, because I think there's a, a little bit more kicking around in it in terms of the effects of violence you know, what, what uh, you know, violence, returning violence for violence actually does. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's weirdly worth it, but I haven't sorted hmm. that part out yet. Okay. <laughs> it's just, it affected me so profoundly, um, you know, kind of got me out of my movie stupor, uh, yeah. which I want to talk about a little later with this other movie that we're going to talk about. But yeah, so it's like, I'm still reeling from it.
if that if that says anything yeah. i really am i'm still i saw it a few days ago and i'm still like you know psyched about it and thinking about it and feeling it god hey if was it visceral thinking about a movie a couple days later that's always says something to me you know yeah yeah right yeah. especially in this day and age when there's so much product out there yeah let's go to femme yeah this is another excellent indie drama it's kind of another thriller it's a british thriller another uh feature film directorial debut there's three of those feature film directorial debuts in this week's crop of movies mm -hmm. it's written and directed by two guys sam h freeman and ning chun ping and what is it about a, a drag performer who works at an east london nightclub he goes outside for a cigarette break after his drag set and he notices this tattooed scary looking guy watching him from afar and then when he notices the guy's looking at him, the guy gets self-conscious and he just kind of leaves. Later, the same drag performer goes to a convenience store to buy cigarettes, but he's he's still in his costume because he just goes right from work. And he notices the scary looking guy in there with his thug friends. The thug friends start hurling homophobic slurs at the drag uh -oh. queen, which result in the scary looking guy following the drag performer outside and beating him to a pulp oh, and no. and and the drag queen's recovery which takes all the three months he a after he's recovered right he goes to this bathhouse this gay bathhouse but he's of course uh without his makeup and guess who happens to be in there who he sees this scary guy who beat the crap out of him in the alleyway and the drag queen of course instantly recognizes this guy as his you know basher but the scary guy doesn't recognize the drag queen as the guy he, he gay bashed because he looks totally different without his make, mm -hmm. makeup. And of course, something begins between the two of them. And we kind of sense that the drag queen is going to set this guy up who bashed him to get revenge on this guy. Mm -hmm. And then the movie takes all kinds of surprising, interesting, and in the good sense of the word, ambiguous turns from there. So the movie is less about gay bashing and more about internalized homophobia, mm -hmm. sexual dynamics, you know, the fine line between attraction and repulsion, love and hate. It's a very creepy, unnerving, and very, very queasy uh, and it might even be a neurotic kind of relationship drama more than a thriller, although it's that too. But it's also psychologically complex. It's beautifully written. It's well-directed. And it leaves you, again, with lots to think about when the end credits roll. It's an excellent film. Um, yeah, if you're into, you know, these uh, well-written, intense indie dramas, it is queasy. Uh, but again, it's surprising. It takes some interesting uh, twists and turns. And again, it... it, it you, you have a lot to think about when it's all over. It's like, wow, what did I just watch? What right. was going on here? Is this is this a revenge thriller? Is it a, a story about forgiveness? Yeah. What is this? I mean, cruelty. Oh, it's it's just really, really, really interesting. The dynamics of the, the relationship dynamics are really, really interesting. So I really, really liked it. Yeah. Okay. It sounds interesting. This yeah. One looks, this one looks like something I would click on. Wicked Little Letters. Yeah, Wicked Little Letters. It's a comedy. From what I can gather, it was this movie was inspired by a true incident that was chronicled in this book called The Little Hampton Libels. Uh, Little Hampton being the seaside town in Sussex, England, you know, where the story takes place right after World War One. And in this story or in this movie iteration of that true incident, uh, dramatically finessed, I have no doubt, Oscar winning actress Olivia Coleman plays <laughs> love her this very, yeah oh she's yeah. So, oh, she's so amazing well she's yeah well where do you hear her cuss anyway <laughs> um uh, she plays this very religious christian spinster who also happens to be the target of this series of very obscene letters which she's getting mailed to her at her home and yeah, obscene with a capital O, certainly nothing I can ever repeat here. And I wouldn't right. want to. And it's really, really funny because she gets these letters and she lives with her parents at home and she gets them and she reads them out loud. Anyway, the, the, the plot of this movie is, hey, who's doing this, right? Who's writing and then mailing the, this religious spinster who lives in a very patriarchal home with her parents, these filthy letters and boy, Boy, are they ever filthy, and boy, is this movie ever funny. There's always been something hilarious to me, Kim, about obscenities spewing out of the mouths of trained British actors. I don't know what it is. No, totally. 
Yeah, but but this movie really capitalizes on this. Yeah. And uh, so it's a comedy and a kind of whodunit, which, you know, I couldn't figure out. You know, I was on, I, I thought it was somebody else sending this lady these obscene yeah. letters. You know, not the one they wanted you to think that there's this foul mouthed uh, frenemy of, uh, of Olivia Coleman's play by Jesse Buckley. But I like that I was off base on that. And uh, yeah, it's just a funny movie, pure and simple. Uh, yeah. Uh, like I say, if you enjoy <laughs> watching, <laughs> listening, and hearing, British actors just read these letters that are just chock full of filth and sexual descriptions that you, I'm, I'm just embarrassed thinking about. You'll love this movie. It's really, really funny. Really Not funny. Not one for the children, I guess, right? I, well, <laughs> unless you're, unless your kids, you know, are used to this kind of language. Yeah. I mean, they may find no. it funny, but I don't know. So I, is this I, I, one... On um, streaming or in theaters? Uh, it's in theaters. Yeah. Okay. It's in, in theaters beginning today, April fifth, Friday. Yep. Musica. Musica. You know, Kim, I say this all the time, but I and I say this to you, and I say it to Nikki, and I say it to everybody I talk to. I see so many movies that sometimes I think I'm just getting cynical about mm. movies. They become more and more difficult to assess. You start thinking you're losing your ability to determine what's good and what's awful because there's just so many of them mm -hmm. hurling at you, demanding your attention. But this movie, Musica, it made me smile. It made me happy. It was so special. It was fresh, and it was just this unqualified delight. It's our third in the, in the feature film directorial debut category. Mm -hmm. This one is the directorial debut of internet personality Rudy Manu Mancuso, who also produces, also writes, also composed the music for, and also stars oh, in wow. this story based on his own experiences. It's a coming-of-age romantic comedy, basically, for the most part. And it's about this Brazilian-American guy. He's just out of college, he's just ready to get out of college, who kind of doesn't really want to go the conventional path in terms of career. He happens to be into music and puppets. <laughs> anyway, he, he's got this condition called synesthesia, which is this neurological condition that makes his brain hear rhythms from the sounds around him, you know, everyday sounds like oh, car yeah. horns and doors slamming and pots and pans clanking or a basketball bouncing on the court. It's a condition that sometimes prevents him from focusing on what others are saying, mm -hmm. you know, in conversation with him. And this condition he has makes for these really inventive and clever and charming and infectious uh, visual sequences in the film. I don't know if I would call them musical numbers, they're more like visual cinematic representations of what a person uh, with uh, synesthesia experiences. Interesting. And they're just wonderful. I mean, the movie very quickly and smartly opens with one of these sequences. You're going, what is this? What is this about? But it immediately pulls you in and signals that you're about to see something and experience something really, really special. And that's what uh, Musica is. It's also a Brazilian culture that is the backdrop for this story. And when was the last time we've seen that in a film? I don't even remember ever seeing, you know, a story about a Brazilian immigrant and American citizen. Um, the, the director and star, uh, Rudy Mancuso's mother, his real life mother, plays his mother in this film. And she's really a good actress too. And we really get a window into what the Brazilian culture is like for a Brazilian immigrant. And it's portrayed very lovingly, very affectionately. We even get smatterings of Portuguese uh, in, in Musica. So what am I saying? This movie just made me happy. It made me smile. It was hugely entertaining. I think it's temporarily anyway relieved me of my cynicism about today's movies. It's just a wonderful, fun, infectious little movie with an irresistible kind of snap, crackle, and pop style. And I just... Mm. Loved it. I was about 20 minutes into the movie. I'm realizing like, God, my mouth is like so sore. And I realized because I've been grinning through the whole movie. I've been smiling through the whole movie. I just, I love this movie. I highly recommend it. Nobody is talking about it. I don't even know if I've ever read a review of it, but it begins streaming on Amazon Prime today. And I, you know, want to encourage everybody listening to check it out if they've got Amazon Prime. Is it it's a, a one. Story? It's a love, yeah. It's it's a romantic comedy. Yeah, there's a yeah. there's a love story component to it. It's got everything. I'm in. And, That's all you had to say. I'm in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you know, what? this is one that you can show the kids, okay, especially good. especially your daughter, because I think she'll really, really 
enjoy the, I don't want to say, they're not really musical sequences. They're sort of like these rhythmic things. Mm -hmm. um, I did think of your daughter when I was watching. I thought, oh yeah, I mean, you know, kids who are into theater would really like, it kind of reminded right. me a little tiny bit of Tick, Tick, Boom, but uh -huh. it was it was its own animal. Um, it's the only movie that I thought of maybe while I was thinking about it afterwards that it kind of reminded me of. But while I was watching yeah. it, it was like the most refreshing, uh, unique movie that I've seen in quite a while. Yeah, that's it's wonderful. Cool. It's wonderful. Just great. Yeah, that loved whole it. phenomena of the seeing and hearing music in your head. Yeah, it reminds me of Stomp. That the performance ah, stomp right where they yeah. hear the street noise and then they expand on the street noise they yeah. turn it into something else yeah, yeah. there's a little yeah there's a little bit of kind of, there's yeah. a flavor of that in, in this too and i guess i guess people with synesthesia too they see colors too oh. um yeah it's just really really interesting really yeah just um yeah right. anyway i loved musica and i highly 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 recommend it <laughs> Let's take a look at remembering Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder, you like Gene Wilder? You I, love Gene Wilder. I do. Isn't, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this movie is is what the title says it is. It's a documentary directed by Ron Frank that remembers and celebrates the life and career of comedy actor extraordinaire Gene Wilder, who was interestingly described and his appeal summed up by somebody in this movie in the beginning. They said he had and I think this describes him really well. He had about him, about his face and about his demeanor, a combination of innocence and danger. Um, yeah, so anyway, that 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 was interesting. And yeah, what's not to like here? I mean, even though he passed away in, in 2016, Wilder himself is the narrator. Uh, his audio version of his autobiography is used here to tell his own story and it's a fascinating one how he met mel brooks how he came to work with richard pryor all the movies are here his debut in bonnie and clyde where he played that undertaker that the barrow gang picks up after they steal his car uh as the accountant leo bloom and the producers as the original and best willy wonka Willie, he's so great as Willy Wonka. Uh, yes. As the Waco Kid in Blazing Saddles, as Dr. Frankenstein in, in Young Frankenstein. All the movies with Richard Pryor are showcased here, Silver Streak, Hanky Panky. Everything you ever wanted to know about his relationships, his relationship with Gilda Radner, uh, who he saw through you know, her cancer. passing of, of cancer. Yeah, that mm -hmm. was very, very sad. And his, his personal history, um, which formed around his whole persona as an actor formed around his very ill mother. Um, his mother was very ill and he had to be very careful of, of being around her. So he got upon the idea of trying to always make her laugh. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, and then his passing from Alzheimer's, he passed away in t uh, 2016. So if you love Gene Wilder and who doesn't, he was a brilliant comic actor and, yeah. and really you, you get that sense. I mean, you know that going in, but you really get a sense of his work and his career and his legacy when you watch this movie. He's, he's a totally unique and one of a kind performer. Um, and if you like Gene Wilder, you'll definitely want to check out this one, Remembering Gene Wilder, it's called. I have, I have to agree with Vilma on this. And I was thinking of a way to say this, but she says it perfectly, that no one can do Willy Wonka better than Gene Wilder. People have tried. They've tried to remake this over and over yeah, again. Yeah. And there's something about his weirdness, but also yeah. lovability or the fact yeah. that we still trust him, even though he's acting all kinds of crazy. There's yeah. something weird about the way he does it that just worked. Yeah, yeah. Well, that the, the who I can't remember who said it in the movie, but they said, yeah, he had this combination of innocence and danger about mm -hmm. him. But you know, like with innocence, of course, yeah, you want to embrace that. And the danger is sort of like, well, what's he going to do next? You know, what is he going to, you know, right. is he going to explode? And he and you see a lot of that in his movies where he's really, really goofy, and then he'll start screaming like uncontrollably, <laughs> like you want to just get out of his way because you think he's going to kill you. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he would. Oh, yeah. He was brilliant as as Willy Wonka. And they, they relate the story in, in the documentary about he was he was dissatisfied about the way Willy Wonka was going to be introduced on screen. They according to the script, they just wanted him to sort of walk on and just walk on. 
But he did this thing where he, and it was something that he just invented on the spur of the moment while they were filming it. He was, he did the walk on and he looked and he looked at the kids and then he did this like somersault and then stood up and, you know, threw out his arms as if to say, you know, welcome, blah, blah, blah. And it totally like threw everybody off, but it really captured Works. how the way, how the rest of the way he was going to play that part, which uh -huh. was like unpredictable. What's he yeah. going to do next, you know? Um, yeah. And then there's that scene where he's, you know, he tells he tells uh, the little boy that, you know, you've you've broken the rules, you failed. He screams at him and he's really, yeah. really kind of cruel to him. But then he just he does this like, you know, double take and he goes into this. But, you know, you win anyway. Blah, blah, blah. And he hugs, you know, he hugs <laughs> the kids and everything. It's sort of like, whoa. In yeah. fact, the movie, I didn't know this about the movie. I learned this from watching the documentary. Apparently, the movie was a box office failure. And it got a lot of blowback from parents who felt that the character was too cruel to children. I didn't know that. Um, so, uh, so the movie didn't do well, but it was one of those movies that developed a life on its own. Now it's considered yeah. a classic. You know, The it's Wizard of Oz. Time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The Wizard of Oz, when it came out, was so expensive a film that it really didn't make a profit and was considered like a prestige film. But of course, over the years, I think it was it's the most watched movie yeah. in, in movie history. So yeah, it's interesting how films can take a, a life on of their own, even though they, they may fail at the box office when they originally opened. Yeah, but yeah. So anyway, lot, and there's lots of interesting stories like that in the yeah. Gene Wilder um, documentary. Yeah. Okay, so we have this last one. Let's see if we can get it in. This is Coup de Chance. Coup de Chance, yes. Coup de Chance. Coup de Chance, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> I had to practice that because uh, I don't speak French. Yeah, but okay. this is French. It's much better than I tried, so there you go. <laughs> it's French for Stroke of Luck, and it's Woody Allen's new movie. It's his 50th film, mm -hmm. and it's his first with English subtitles, it's all in French. It was shot in Paris. It's a first for the director. And you know, the least said, we don't have a lot of time anyway, the least said about the plot, the better. But we, we can say that this is a relationship thriller. Dead serious. There's a couple of chuckles, but for the most part, it's a dead serious adult drama, a crime thriller actually, that's filled with Woody Allen's, you know, familiar philosophical musings and observations about men and women and marriage and romance and sex and adultery and you know questions like are we ruled by chance or coincidence and it's also it also deals in murder as well mm -hmm. uh the superficial lives of the one percent are contrasted here with the bohemian artist and there's some sage advice from alan about not squandering the miracle that is your life. It's an excellent script, excellent French cast. It's at times a very dark but very rich film too, in my opinion. Uh, late period vintage Woody Allen. It's his best film in years, in my opinion, and I I, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's on VOD and digital, but it's, no theaters. No theaters. Not no Bay Area theaters. It's opening it's his in fiftieth movie. Well, uh, fiftieth movie. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's That's... prolific. He does like. Yeah. You know when he he shoots a movie and then he, you know when he's shooting the movie he's even thinking about his next movie and when it's in post production he's he's either already have it have uh, he's already having written the next one and preparing the next one and by the time he's shooting that one the other one that he did previously didn't even come out so yeah he's extremely prolific but i believe he's like in his late 80s and he's still doing okay. it he's still got it. this is a really yeah. really good movie a real good adult film yeah okay. so before we go and i know we have to wrap it up but i just wanted to share a couple comments with you donald oh, the main coon says i watched the new amazon movie musica last night it was very good and funny he agreed with you oh yay vilma said wicked little letters sounds interesting on a light level and she would watch it trevor star in hollywood says who doesn't love gene wilder brilliant and yeah. vilma agrees gene wilder loved his movies so hey like Tim good feedback to this week Tim yeah. Sega, thank you for bringing us all these great reviews. I'm uh, I'm definitely <laughs> welcome, interested Tim. in Musica. I think I'm going to watch that tonight. So thank you for the recommendation. Yeah, and and, yeah. and you, you can let me know what you think about it next week when we talk okay, again. Okay, we'll do. Okay, I look Kim. forward to it. Have a great right, weekend, Kim. Tim. Yeah, you too, Kim. Thanks so much. Have Bye. a good one. Bye.
Love Tim Sika. What a treat to get to have him here every week and uh, and talk about movies with him. Okay, so huge thank you to Marilyn. Luis times uh, three, I think. Yes, Luis, over and over again, Luis, for supporting the show. Thank you. Also, huge thank you to Brian and to Cindy. Uh, Spencer Jaffe, huge thank you to you. Uh, and again, Luis, you guys... We so appreciate you supporting the show. Thank you for being here. Nikki will be gone on Monday. I will be here. And then on Tuesday, we have a guest that uh, co-authored a paper on how successful electric vehicles have been when it comes to reducing the carbon footprint in California. So look forward to that for next week. Stay dry today and have a really good weekend. And I will see you on the Mark Thompson Show in just moments. But until then, here's Jake. Nikki, you're all so awesome, you sprout, like a beautiful blossom, you're all so the best, I really can't rest, you're all so awesome. <laughs> wow, okay. Nikki, you're all so awesome, you sprout like a beautiful blossom.